So today we are going to begin our series of lectures on the Nectar of Instruction. This book is a translation by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, our founder Acharya of ISKCON. The book was originally written by Srila Rupa Goswami as Sri Upadesh Amrita and Srila Prabhupada has very kindly translated it as well as commented upon it. So I shall request all of you to 
If you don't already have a copy, then at least tonight you should secure one copy. Uh, Sarva Bhama Prabhu will have them available so that beginning tomorrow we can chant together the mantras because each night we will be covering one of the mantras from this book. Today we will be reciting the first text which I will recite and read the translation of. Bacho Vegam Manashakurota Vegam Jiva Vegam Mutarapashta Vegam Etan Vegam Yoga Sahita Tira Sarvam Apimam Pritivim Sashishyat Translation A sober person who can tolerate the urge to speak the mind's demands, the actions of anger, and the urges of the tongue, belly, and genitals is qualified to make disciples all over the world. Srila Rupa Goswami begins the first mantra and Srila Prabhupada comments discussing the idea of prayas jitta or atonement. There is a nice quote in this regard by Maharaj Pariksit from Srimad Bhagavatam. He asks Sukadev Goswami, why do people undergo atonement? if they cannot control their senses. Uh, by atonement we understand to make up for some sinful activity that one has performed. Just as we see sometimes a person goes to a temple or church and asks for God's forgiveness for something that he or she has done wrong. However, we see that in the next week, very often, they go and do the same thing over, all over again. Therefore, Maharaj Pariksha said, what is the point of this? A thief steals, for which he is thrown in prison. Now it should be considered that prison is like a type of atonement. You serve out your sentence. And yet, what do we find? That after coming out of prison, what do most thieves do? They steal again. So, Maharaj Pariksit very intelligently is saying, what is the purpose of it, if this is going to happen again and again? Now, an intelligent man, the most intelligent man, learns by hearing. He learns that such and such act is wrong and should not be done, and so he avoids Someone who is not so intelligent sees how other people are suffering from committing some sinful activity. And by seeing the suffering of others, he learns. Most intelligent person learns by hearing. The next intelligent class of men, he learns only by seeing. But someone who is a complete fool, who has heard, who has seen, still does not understand, that person has no hope for any kind of advancement. Ultimately, we have to understand that atonement cannot wipe away sins. The example commonly given is of the elephant. The elephant takes his bath, but after bathing in the water, again he rubs dirt or throws dirt, you know, rolls in the dirt and makes himself unclean. So the fact is that sinful activity cannot be overcome by pious acts. This is not possible. The one cannot wipe away the other. Just like we say that you cannot commit sins on the strength of chanting the holy name of the Lord. 
that chanting will not actually free you from sinful activities. Srila Prabhupada finally gives the solution. He says that if you really want to overcome sinful activity, then the only way is to awaken your dormant Krishna consciousness. We say dormant Krishna consciousness because it is understood that everyone has Krishna consciousness within them. So by awakening our real Krishna consciousness, then we can actually overcome all kinds of sins. I have got personal experience that before I met Prabhupada, I used to do a lot of fasting. I like to fast. So sometimes I would fast practically from eating anything for many, many, many days in a row. But then after the fast, I would immediately run to the ice cream parlor and eat many ice creams. So simply trying to negate something, that will not actually control our senses, etc. Now when we eat ice cream, at least we make sure that it's prashada. So it's a little different. So ultimately, the way to control sinful life is through tapasya. Tapasya means voluntary austerity. In other words, to give up something which one ordinarily might want to do for the purpose of some higher realization. This is tapasya. Now, the process of yoga is very good for tapasya. The yogi begins by brahmacharya. He is a celibate and he controls the mind, he performs austerities, he controls his senses, he gives up all his possessions. This is yoga. In the Bhagavad Gita, sixth chapter, you can read about such yoga. But ultimately, this yoga is very difficult. That is why Arjuna tells Krishna that the process of yoga which you have recommended is too difficult for me to perform. For example, most of you are married. So the type of yoga explained in Bhagavad Gita, it would not be possible. You could not live with your wife and still practice that yoga. You could not live in Houston and still practice that type of yoga. You could not go to your job every day and still practice this type of yoga. So how is it practical? It is not practical. It was not practical 5,000 years ago, much less today. However, there is a type of yoga which is very practical in the present age. And that practice is called bhakti, bhakti yoga. And Srila Rupa Goswami recommends this bhakti yoga. He says you should get the association of Krishna's devotees and under the guidance of the guru, spiritual master, you should follow the four principles regulating your spiritual life. That means avoid intoxication, gambling, meat eating and illicit sex life. And serve Krishna in all of your activities. And in this way, you will derive the benefit that the yogis derived many, many thousands of years ago. This is practical for the present day and age. Now, in any case, whatever type of yoga you perform, including bhakti, you have to learn to control your senses. And this is especially the purpose or purport of this particular text today. How to control the senses. The first sense which is discussed is how to control the speech. When we speak of control, we mean to control some type of urge. In the uh, verse today, we hear the word begum. Vega means urge, some type of pushing force, uh, irresistibly pushing force, just like the desire to speak. It's very difficult to control this desire. You try, say, during the to try for one day in a row not to speak at all. You'll see it is very difficult because the tongue wants to vibrate so many different things. Sometimes the vibrating tongue is compared to be like a croaking toad. 
Do you know this example of the croaking toad? The toad is always making sounds. Frog is always making sounds, especially during the rainy season. But this, it is like a warning signal, a bell for the snakes. Because when the snakes hear the toads croaking, they immediately know, here, here is my dinner. See, it's my dinner time. It's like ringing the dinner bell. So the toads croak and the snakes move and then they know exactly where to find their dinner. And they swallow up the croaking toad. In the same way, people who simply have material talking all the time, who talk materially all the time, they are calling the snake of death. This is example given. That they are ringing the bell. Here I am. Here I am. Come and get me. Actually, as I said this morning in class, it is, or maybe yesterday we mentioned this, that everyone is born with a certain number of breaths. So when you use up your breath on material topics, you're shortening your life with no ultimate good. So this is never advisable. Now, what is the solution? You may say the solution is not to talk at all. No. That is simply negative. The real solution is to talk Krishna Kata. Srinvatam Sa Kata Krishna Punya Shavana Kirtana. Always chant the glories of Krishna. This will be the proper utilization of the talk tongue, of the speaking tendency. So we can see just like our picture on the wall of Srila Sukadev Goswami. He achieved perfection. How? By speaking Srimad Bhagavatam. If anyone will speak Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita, even one verse, it will have immense benefit. Srila Prabhupada said that if you will vibrate one chapter of Bhagavad Gita daily, the whole atmosphere becomes purified. So some of you may like to do that. You can sit at home and every day read one chapter of Gita. You can read it in Sanskrit, read it in English, read it in whatever language you find convenient. But the sound vibration will purify the atmosphere. It is such a powerful thing, Shabda Brahma. It is transcendental sound, not mundane sound. So this type of sound should be spoken. The next thing which we have to control is anger. Quote. Huh? No, before anger comes mind. Mind comes first because the mind is very flickering. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna and Arjuna are discussing the mind. And Arjuna says that it is more difficult to control the mind than to control the raging wind. You know how one time some years ago in Houston, remember that big storm that blew out all the windows? Huh? What was the name? Alicia, uh -huh. Hurricane Alicia. So she, is that a female or male? <laughs> she. Yeah. Hell hath no fury like a woman's breath. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, hurricane, she blew out all the windows in Houston. That's it. And yet Arjuna says that as difficult as it is to control that hurricane, there was no there was no way to control. When that hurricane came, everybody just took shelter. And yet Arjuna says that the mind is even more difficult to control. If you think it's difficult to control the hurricane, the mind is even more difficult to control. So therefore we find that this control of the mind has to be practiced. Now it is mentioned that uh, there's a very nice description here, which I will read to you. I think, calm her down. She's as difficult to control as Alicia. Here is a very nice verse from Chaitanya Chaitamrita. Krishna Surya Sam Maya Haya Andakar Yahan Krishna Tahan Nahi Maya Adikar. Krishna is just like the sun, and Maya is just like darkness. If the sun is present, there is no question of darkness. Similarly, if Krishna is present in the mind, 
There is no possibility of the minds being agitated by Maya's influence. We have to understand that the cause of our mental agitation is due to the presence of Maya, the material energy. This is described by Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. He says that there are different causes of agitation to the mind. The first is called Abhiroda Kriti, which means unrestricted attachment. For example, when you believe that the fruitive results of karma will make you happy. This becomes very agitating to the mind. In other words, when you start making materialistic plans, so many different plans, and then you think, how will I fulfill these plans? And if I can fulfill these plans, how much I will enjoy. Now, all of these type of thoughts become very agitating to the mind. And for the karmis, this type of agitation is 24 hours a day. Even in their dreams, they think like this. How will I get my desires fulfilled? And who is stopping me from fulfilling these desires? And how will I conquer over that person? And when I conquer, how much I will enjoy? This is how they're always thinking. And their mind is not at all peaceful. Therefore, when we say to them, please come here to our temple, please listen to a lecture, they say, I have no time, I have no time. They have no time because they have no peace of mind. So this type of karma, karma body mentality, it is very disturbing. Another agitation is described due to the Maya body philosophy, the philosophy that all is one, uh, that we discussed yesterday, that everything is simply oneness. This also leads to mental agitation because there's no shelter. When someone approached me yesterday, Yes, one devotee approached me yesterday and she was asking me about the universal form of the Lord. She said that sometimes the universal form of the Lord sounds very fearful. So how will I become peaceful? So I said the best way to become peaceful is to see the form of Sri Sri Radha Nilamada. Because immediately one will get peace of mind. In the same way, thinking about Mayavad philosophy is just another step beyond the universal form. It's the universe, right? If the, if the, if the uh, Virat group is the universal form, the universe without form is Mayavad philosophy. Everything is one, Brahman. And this is even more agitating to the mind. One cannot become peaceful because there's no shelter. Just like we say, when you go up in an airplane, how much can you enjoy? They try to give you something to do, right? They give you some airplane magazine. They put up some video. They give you a dinner. Even in some airplanes, they have slot machines. Let's say in the Orient, they have airplanes with slot, one-armed bandits, and people are always playing. But sooner or later, they say, all right, enough of this. I want to land. When are we, you ask the pilot, when are we going to land? Because unless you can get landing somewhere, shelter, you can't be peaceful. In the same way, until Krishna comes in your mind, there's no peace of mind. So, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Man mana bhava mad bhakto mad yaji Engage your mind always in thinking of me. Then you will be peaceful, Arjuna. And actually, Arjuna found that. After seeing the universal form, he said to Krishna, my dear Krishna, this form is very bewildering, this form of the universe. Please resume your original two-armed form playing on a flute. That will give me some solace and peace of mind. This is the form that I love most dearly. So this form is the most dear to Krishna. Therefore, the most dear to the devotees. Therefore, you'll find in all of our ISKCON temples, the form of Krishna is there. Because immediately the devotees become very relieved, very soothing. You see, it's described that Krishna's lotus feet are like millions and millions of moons. Because it is said, not only Krishna's feet, Krishna's face is compared to be like a moon. Krishna's, there are different parts of Krishna's bodies which are compared to the moon. 
Why? Because the moonbeam is said to be soothing. As the sun's rays are scorching, the moonbeams are considered to be very cooling, soothing. And seeing Krishna immediately cools the burning fever of material existence. So we want to see Krishna's form. And when we see his form, when we chant his name, immediately we feel pacified. Our mind becomes very calm in this. Ultimately, if you can't control your mind, the next problem comes, which is anger. Anger is due to frustration of material desire. As I said, the mind becomes agitated when there are too many material desires. And when you can't fulfill your desire, what happens? You become frustrated. And from frustration comes anger. That's it. There's a direct connection. You can see this is a real science. Actually, this is science. This is, this is perfect psychology. Sometimes people say, well, I can't just believe in blind faith religion. We are not talking about blind faith religion. This is an actual scientific understanding. The great saintly persons, Srila Vyasadeva and the great Acharyas, they have made a scientific analysis of the whole process, even Krishna himself. Who can be a better scientist than Krishna? So Krishna very nicely states this in Bhagavad Gita, that from, from contemplating the objects of the senses, desire comes lust, and then frustration, and then ultimately anger. Now, no one likes anger, because when you get angry, what happens? Your memory becomes bewildered. Your intelligence becomes covered, right? You lose your intelligence. You, you say things that you don't want to say. You hurt people in a way that you didn't really mean it. Afterwards, you have to apologize. So nobody likes to be angry, but how to control anger? Now you're going to be very surprised about what Srila Prabhupada gives as a solution. You will be surprised. The example for controlling anger, can anyone guess? Let's see how transcendentally sharp you are. Can anyone give an example of how to control anger? Loudly? Could anyone hear? Chant loudly. Okay, that's a very good answer. Can anyone? I want to hear an example of someone. Yes. Ah. Now, here's a very intelligent man. He says, a good example of how to control anger is Hanumanji. Now, everyone knows Hanuman. Hanuman became very angry. So you may say, how can you say he controlled anger? He did control anger because he used anger in the service of Lord Ram. And in this way, he got rid of all his anger. He immediately flew over the Indian Ocean into Lanka and he set the whole kingdom of Ravana on fire. He burned the kingdom with his anger. So the uh, uh, advice of Srila Prabhupada is that simply to Control anger by chanting loudly is one way, but another way is to positively use anger in the service of the Lord or in the service of the Lord's devotees. Can anyone give an example of how anger was used to protect the devotees? A famous example from Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. Huh? Very good, very good. When Lord Chaitanya saw that Nityananda Prabhu was hurt, some earthen pot was thrown on his head by Jagayan Madai, Lord Nityananda became so angry that he was going to kill Jagayan Madai. And this same Lord Chaitanya says, Trinada Pisini Chaitanya Roda Pisini Amani Namanadaina Kirtanya Sthai. He says you have to be very tolerant. Lord Chaitanya teaches us, be very tolerant. And yet, when it came to his devotees being offended, he was very intolerant. He became very angry. So anger can be used to protect Krishna 
and to protect Krishna's devotees. But not otherwise for oneself. For oneself, one may become very meek and humble. One may tolerate all kinds of inconvenience. Just like Haridas Thakur is a perfect example of tolerance. But one will not tolerate offenses against the devotees. So this is a practical example. And another example is Arjuna. What did Krishna tell Arjuna? Fight for me. Get angry. Arjuna was too peaceful. Krishna agitated Arjuna to become transcendentally angry. So this point is very important to understand. In spiritual life, we do not deny emotions, but we try to understand the pure form of all emotions. Just like anger, there is spiritual anger. No one will ever say that Hanuman, that his anger is materialistic. No one can say that. Everyone knows that Hanuman is the purest devotee of the Lord. So he cannot be guilty of material emotions. If he is angry, it's a spiritual form of anger. The impersonalists, when they see Hanuman getting angry, they say, oh, anger? Oh, then that means that he is not very advanced. That is their calculation. When they see Mother Yasoda uh, getting in anxiety, where is Krishna? They say, oh, anxiety? She could not be very advanced. She must be in Maya. When they see the gopis crying because of separation from Krishna, they say, crying? Oh, what is that? She cannot be very advanced. Because they deny spiritual emotions. Whereas we understand that in the purified conditions, all of these emotions are still there. So there's a very important distinction between the devotee and the impersonalist. Now there are three more. The urge of the tongue, the belly, and the genitals. These three are mentioned and they're all in one line. Tongue, belly, and genitals. So it stands to reason that if the tongue can be controlled, then the other two automatically come under control. Control of the tongue uh, means to only take Krishna Prasad and only to chant Hare Krishna. We don't eat other food, just like we don't go to restaurants, because we understand that that food is not offered to the Lord. Therefore, it will not control my tongue. Lord Chaitanya has given a very important quotation. He says that one who eats food which is not offered to the Lord such a person's mind has great difficulty in thinking of Krishna. You may say, I don't see the connection, but actually there's a connection. The current consciousness of the cooking is placed within the food. So a person who is too much materialistic while cooking, that food gives the effect of making your mind polluted. And therefore, it is very difficult to remember Krishna after eating such karmic food. Now, in regard to the tongue, there are many types of victims, someone who is victimized, and they are described. First of all, the obvious victim of the tongue is someone who eats prohibited food. Uh, prohibited food means food produced like meat, fish, eggs. And there's a very uh, graphic explanation for this food. You may say, what's wrong with meat, fish, or eggs? Why is it unclean? The description is given. Meat, fish, and eggs are produced from semina and blood. That's what it is. Semina, blood, or ovulation. Therefore, these things are not clean. When we think of it in this way, we realize this is not clean food. Food produced from semina, food produced by blood, food produced by ovulation. This is not very clean. It's not fit for human consumption. So, victims of the tongue include people who eat these types of food. Another type is someone who's a vegetarian, but is simply eating unoffered food. There are many vegetarians in America today. Vegetarianism is very popular. 
But those vegetarians are not prasadarians. They are not eating Krishna prasadam. They're simply eating for their own sense enjoyment. So these persons are also incurring sin. We are not advocates of vegetarianism. We are advocates of prasad taking, taking Krishna prasadam. Another type of victim of the tongue is someone who takes intoxication. Prabhupada lists many different types of intoxication. I can read you some that Prabhupada mentioned. He says, Pan, Hari Taki, Bagel Nuts, various spices used in pan making, tobacco, LSD, marijuana, opium, liquor, coffee, and tea, etc. There are so many types of intoxication. So anyone who, is a, who takes these intoxicants is a victim of his tongue. He's not under perfect sense control. And finally, there's another type which can often victimize the devotees. Are you ready for this? Overeating prasadam because it is too palatable. See, all the devotees are smiling. As everybody knows, this is where the devotees may become a victim. And there are three different categories. Now, Lord Chaitanya taught us to eat sparingly of palatable prasad dishes. Lord Chaitanya himself used to prefer bitter vegetables, and he would only eat a little bit of prasad. Of course, sometimes they gave huge quantities, and being the Lord, he could do so. But generally, he advised to only take a little bit of the Maha Prasadam because it will be very rich. The deities, for example, have everything cooked in ghee. So, therefore, we may eat normal Prasad, but we take a little bit of the Maha Prasadam, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's advice. Another thing is if we offer the deity very palatable foods, thinking that when Krishna finishes, I'm going to eat. <laughs> so this is another victimization of the tongue. This is not, <laughs> you should not be thinking like this. And another thing is to accept invitations from others with the idea of enjoying very nice dishes. You know, someone is offering some invitation and you're thinking, oh, this person's very, wife is a very good cook. Certainly I will go to his home. <laughs> this is all not very, that's not very good. In other words, as far as possible, we should try to see ourselves as Krishna servants, not as enjoyers. It may take some time for us to learn this way of thinking, but really in the pure consciousness, we simply think how to please Krishna. We don't think for our own enjoyment. So ultimately, if we can control the tongue, then the belly, and of course the genitals also become controlled. If one overeats, there's a tendency for too much sex life. These are all, if one takes intoxication, again, tendency for sex life. Of course, the purification of sex life is to bring up children in Krishna consciousness. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Dhamma Varu Dabhute Shu Kamosmi Bharata Sabha. That sex life for the purpose of having Krishna conscious children and raising the children to love Krishna, that is again how to use something in the service of the Lord. Just as Hanuman used anger for Krishna's service, sex life may also be used in the service of God if it produces godly children. So these are the various descriptions given by Rupa Goswami and Srila Prabhupada for controlling the different urges. The senses are called go. And one who can control the senses is called Go Swami or Swami. But one who is controlled by the senses, that person is called Godasa, a victim or servant of his senses. So we want to learn how to become Go Swamis. This book, Nectar of Instruction, is meant for Go Swamis. And actually, we are all meant to become the followers of Srila Rupa Goswami. Therefore, we are referred to as Rup Anuga. Anuga means one who follows. And who? We follow Srila Rupa Goswami. 
So the way to follow Rupa Goswami will be to get this book, study it very carefully, and follow all of its instructions. So we will stop here now and ask if any of you have any questions on today's text. Yes? Please speak loudly. You mentioned that the mind is controlled by fixing such stuff within the mind that we're using for some blessing is for. But uh, from experience, I've, my experience, I've experienced that when the mind is in a very agitated condition, it's very difficult for the mind to be attracted to a strong person. So uh, I was wondering if you could. The way to fix the mind on Krishna is by trying to carry out the instructions of the spiritual master. To fix the form of Krishna within the mind is an advanced state. To always remember Krishna within the mind is an advanced state. So in the beginning we should at least try to fix up the instructions of the spiritual master within the mind. Just like this morning in the class, Gopala Chari Prabhu gave a nice example of how one devotee went out to, what was it, to buy some fruit? Buy an eggplant. Prabhupada sent one of his disciples to the store to purchase some eggplant. So on the way to the store, he was seeing so many things and his mind started to get bewildered. And then he went in the supermarket. You know what a supermarket is like. Right? There's so many aisles, and in every aisle there's hundreds of products, and you start thinking, you know, I could really use that, and this one is pretty good, and you know, I think I'll get that. And before you know it, your mind is completely disturbed. So when this devotee came back to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, I, I went out and bought the egg from my mind. He said, I went, my mind is so disturbed now. That's what he said. He said, my mind is so disturbed from going out. So then Prabhupada said, but did you buy the eggplant? He said, I bought the eggplant, but my mind is a sir. Prabhupada said, that doesn't matter, at least you bought the eggplant. Now you may say, well, what is the meaning behind this? The meaning behind it is that we begin to control our mind by using it in the service of Krishna under the instruction of Guru. When we get an instruction from the spiritual master and we use our mind to find a way to fulfill that instruction, that will gradually train the mind. When the mind becomes perfectly trained, then Krishna will automatically be fixed up there. Krishna meditation comes as you begin to discipline your mind. And the way to discipline the mind is under direct instruction from Guru. So that's the answer. Carry out the orders of your spiritual master and it will not be difficult to fix up Krishna within the mind. Of course, by purification, the more purified one is, the more all of one's senses are used in Krishna's service. So, even for a neophyte who may become angry, there's some trends in if, if they're angry on behalf of the Lord. Just like we see, sometimes the devotee goes out and preaches and meets up with some person who, be, you know, poses so many arguments and a devotee becomes angry with that person. Now that may be a neophyte reaction, but still that devotee gets advancement. Because he is trying to defend Krishna. His anger may not have been perfectly utilized, but still he gets some benefit. 
But we should understand that as we become more and more advanced, then all of our emotions are totally Krishna conscious and not artificial. Just like we see that a small child, not small, but supposing someone is eight years old. Have you ever seen little girls when they get to be eight or nine? What do they do? They watch their mother, then they put on makeup themselves, right? They put their lipstick over here, you know, and they put some powder on, and they maybe they put on their mother's high heels, right, and they walk around. So this is an imitation. But it's to be understood that gradually through this imitation, they will, con they will gradually develop the na nature of a grown woman. So in the same way, emotions have to be learned in this way. In the beginning, we practice. Well, even though they may not be so natural, we have to practice them. Then gradually, these emotions will develop in a natural, real way. Just like, uh, well, all of these emotions have to be learned gradually. They'll come. They'll come. But uh, as far as anger goes, generally, you have to control anger. Anger is not to be used very often, but in some rare circumstances it can be used. But as uh, one devotee answered tonight, that is the best way, control anger through chanting. But in some cases, anger has its proper use. A devotee is not afraid to become angry if there's a proper purpose for it. But then you have to be very careful, for example, if you become angry with another devotee, because then you may come into the point of Vaishnava Aparad. The Vaishnava Aparad means that unnecessarily you offend another devotee. We're going to learn about that in the next two days lectures. You will learn how dangerous this can be if you cannot judge the advancement of another devotee and you become angry with them even though they may be more advanced than you are. It can become very dangerous and it checks your advancement in spiritual life. So one has to be very careful about anger. Would you like to say something about it? Yes, if a, if a devotee becomes angry, wrongly, wrong, wrong use of anger, especially if he becomes angry upon another devotee, then it can destroy his spiritual advancement. So it's dangerous. Another question? In our culture, it's sort of like a diet that's more healthy and conducive to spiritual life. You can find someone who eat a lot of vegetarian foods to make this big long person do. But in our society, it's, it's easier for people to have a more complete meal of eating. But I'm the one kind of, you know, Sarvam Prabhu asks that sometimes when one eats a big meal in the evening, the tendency is to sleep longer the next morning. But because one goes to work and other things, one may only be able to eat in the evening. So what to do? I think you have to ask people who do that. I don't know because I don't eat in the evening. Prabhupada did say that if you eat one main meal, it doesn't matter whether it's in the morning, noon, or evening. If there's one main meal, basically, then you can eat in the evening and still there will be no problem. So I think the real point is not so much what time you eat as much as how much you eat. If you eat the proper amount and don't overeat, then even if you eat in the evening, there's no problem. The problem with us, say those devotees who are at the temple, is they eat a big meal at noon, then if they eat at the evening time, then it's overeating. But persons who go to work generally cannot eat much during the daytime. So they may eat a full meal at night. Everybody has to eat according to their means. An elephant can eat 100 pounds without any overeating. And an ant can eat one grain of sugar. 
So each person must judge their capacity. Okay. Uh, the idea of using yoga to control sex desire is um, not perfect because there's a number of examples in the Vedic literatures of yogis who were very, very advanced in yoga practice, like Sobhari Muni. He was so advanced that he could live underneath the water without having to breathe. He's a very advanced yogi. But still, he became agitated. By seeing two fish copulating, he became agitated. So the example is given that unless one becomes an unalloyed devotee of the Lord, simply trying to restrain the mind or senses will not ultimately uh, absorb one and take one away from sex agitation. Um, as far as trying to meditate on Krishna, say for an hour or two hours, that is very nice. Uh, but then that's only one or two hours. Then there are still 22 more hours or 23 more hours. So the uh, Vaishnav Acharyas have recommended a system of constant activity in Krishna's service, variegated activity. Some of it is meditation. For example, when you chant on beats, that is supposed to be done with your mind absorbed on Krishna. So that would be a perfect opportunity to practice the type of meditation you're talking about. Within your mind, you meditate on the form of the Lord, and with your tongue, you vibrate his holy name, and with your ears, you hear that sound vibration. With your touch, you touch the Tulsi bead, which is a pure devotee of the Lord. So here's a perfect way to absorb all of your senses in Krishna meditation. And that actually is the positive way to get over sex life. Otherwise, saying sex life is no good, that's simply negating. There has to be something which is better to absorb yourself in. Otherwise, to simply try to renounce sex life is not possible. Is that? Another question? All right. So, Sarabhama, where will you be if people want to get this book? Where are your copies of the book? Is that what those are on the table here? So we'll have a short chanting, and then as you go out, I request everybody to try and get a copy of this book, and tomorrow we will chant the mantra responsibly. Now we can all chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama.